I am so grateful that you are here with us. And uh, I love that we have first-time guests in the room with us. Uh, Bellevue members, aren't y'all grateful we have guests in the room? Amen? Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. And I want to say one more time, if you are a guest, please text guest to 901-901. We would love to connect with you. We're so grateful that you're here. Uh, and it's a privilege to be with you this morning. As Brother Steve said, my name is Daniel. Uh, I'm from, I went to Bartlett High School, graduated from the University of Memphis. And uh, it's an honor to be here with you. Some of our college students from The View are here as well. And uh, it's an honor to be with you this morning and to open up God's word with you. If you will, open up with me to Psalm 51. Yeah. Amen. They're a wild group. <laughs> but they get excited about God's word. Amen. Amen. Before I was called to be a pastor, I was on the track to become a high school basketball coach, eventually coaching college. And uh, before I came to Bellevue, I was coaching basketball at Bartlett High School, and I did a number of years there. And, and let me tell you, I fell in love with the kids. My wife is now a teacher at Bartlett, and when I was coaching at Bartlett, I fell in love with those ninth to 12th graders. Now, you have to understand, a lot of them, especially the basketball players, came from rough backgrounds, single-parent homes. A lot of them struggled with temptation. A lot of them struggled with alcohol and, and just didn't, and marijuana and stuff like that, and just didn't have the best home life. So not all of them, but a lot of them. And uh, there was a lot of struggles that came with it. And for me as a young coach, I really wanted to make my mark. Like I remember for me it was a big deal to try to prove myself as a young coach. And the Lord really broke me of that. You know, there's a lot of people in here this morning that are just trying to prove themselves to the world. Let me tell you, it's a tiring, tiring mission, is it not? Because when you're trying to prove yourself to the world, you're never going to add up. And you have to know what Jesus has said about you. And I realized very quickly that coaching basketball was not about me. I realized that God had put me there for those kids because those kids desperately needed Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, I love your career. I don't know what it is, but I love your career. I love your workplace. But you're there, and it's not about you. God has placed you there because those people desperately need Jesus. And as a young coach, I had to do a lot of things I didn't like, man. I'll be honest with you. I had to get there at 4 a.m. for our 5 a.m. practices. That means waking up at 3.30. And I'm a morning person. I like my sleep. And it's the 11 o'clock service. So y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I like my sleep. Y'all know. It's 11 o'clock service. I know how it is. <laughs> and uh, I like my sleep. But one of the toughest things I had to do as a coach, and we had 60 kids in our program, after every practice, one thing that I had to do is I had to wash every player's jerseys and shorts. Yeah, I hear you in the back. Yeah, let me tell you something. If you want to know what high school boys' jerseys smell like, <laughs> it's a combination of fungi and Axe body spray. <laughs> and if you're wearing Axe body spray, don't be mad at me. Don't leave. <laughs> but it's not what you want to smell in the locker room. And we had 60 kids in the program, and I have to wash their jerseys, have to wash their shorts. And what I would do is it was meticulous. It would take time. We would, me and a buddy of mine, we'd wash every jersey, every short. We would go to their locker. We would hang it up, and we'd lay the shorts out, every single one, one by one. Hang the jersey up, lay the shorts out, hang the jersey up, lay the shorts out. It was work. It was hard. It wasn't easy. And I dreaded it a lot of days. But to be honest with you, Bellevue family, I was shook when that turned out to be one of my favorite things about coaching. And Drew knows with coaching, one of my favorite things about that is I loved washing their jerseys and their shorts. I tell people they think I'm crazy, but I love it. And the reason why is because I loved that moment when they would come in the locker room in the morning, 5 a.m. Of course, they're getting there at 432, and they see their jersey and their shorts is all ready to go. And they would smile. And I came to love seeing their smile. And the reason why they would smile is because of this. They realized that what they had made dirty was made clean for them by the work of somebody else. I fell in love with it. And this morning, as we look at Psalm 51, we're going to talk about repentance. But I want you to understand, in church, we talk about repenting of sin a lot. And the reason why is because we struggle with sin a lot. <laughs> you don't have to go to seminary to understand that. I know myself. Whether you're 20 or whether you're 80, sin is a problem as long as we are in the flesh. But what I want you to see this morning is that there is a beauty that comes with repentance. In fact, every single time that you in your heart go to God to repent of sin, you have a reason to smile. And the reason why is because you're reminded that what you and I have made dirty through sin is made clean for us by the work and sacrifice of somebody else, Jesus Christ. But why do we not do that? Why do we not repent of sin? Why do we not talk to people we love? I believe it's because we think we're too far in. We think we're stuck. We think we can never get out. We think that this whole God thing, this whole Bible thing ain't really for me. We're as a believer and we've been struggling for years, so we think there's no way out. It's too shameful to tell anybody that, man, I've been a believer for 10 years and I still struggle with this. And ultimately, we think that it's too late for us to be restored by God. 
I have a beautiful message this morning. The title is, if you're taking notes, and I hope that you are, it's never too late. Amen. As long as you have breath in your lungs, it is never too late for you to come to God. Now, as we look at Psalm 51, many of you may be familiar with it, and many of you may not, and that's okay. It's a prayer. It's a prayer from King David after he was confronted by Nathan on the sin that he had in his life. Now, this is a gut-wrenching prayer. And when we're in sin, we need gut-wrenching prayers. We need to pour our heart out to the Lord. We need honesty. We need realness. We need realness in the church. We need realness amongst our communities. The believer, we need realness. And this is a real prayer, let me tell you something. Now, David has fallen into sin. Some of you know David's testimony. David has fallen into major sin. This is the man after God's own heart, remind you. This is the man after God's own heart. So as much as I'm preaching to anyone in here who doesn't know Jesus, all across the balcony, whoever doesn't know Jesus, I'm praying that you will come to Jesus. But even for those of you who know Jesus as your Savior, David fell into major sin. And if we're not careful, we can fall into major sin too. Now, what happened with David, you'll remember, he wasn't where he was supposed to be. Derek mentioned it last night, probably this morning too. He was supposed to be at war, and instead of at war, he was living luxuriously on a balcony. He sees Bathsheba, sees some he shouldn't see. His eyes go to a place where his eyes shouldn't go, and, and what he sees leads to sin. How many of you know when we see things we shouldn't see, it leads to sin we shouldn't give into? Amen? His eyes. And what he does is he commits sin, adultery. And then he has Uriah killed in battle, murder. And he falls into a plethora of sins. And finally, after he's confronted, he comes. And these are his words to God. So for anybody in here who needs the Lord this morning, look with me at Psalm chapter, Psalm 51, starting in verse 1. David, after being confronted about this sin, he says, Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love. According to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. I love in verse 1 that he's asking for abundant compassion. In other words, he's praying for big mercy because he has big sin. And some of us in here know exactly what that's like. He's praying for big mercy. Verse 2, completely, not partially, but completely wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. David says, for I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. Verse 4, against you, you alone, God, I have sinned. I have done evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence because you are blameless when you judge. And then skip down to verse 10, if you will. David says, we love it, we know it, we memorize it. God, create a clean heart in me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Verse 12, restore the joy of your salvation to me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me. And sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Verse 13, I love this. There's an action that comes after repentance. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will really turn to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to open up your word. And God, I pray that you would have every word and I would have none, Lord. Who cares what I have to say? We want to hear from you. And so, Father, I pray this morning for anyone in here who doesn't know you as their Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. Father, I pray for all of us as believers, as we struggle, as we try to be like Jesus, as we look to do it not through willpower, but through the power of your Spirit. Father, I pray that you would restore us today. I pray that you would restore marriages. I pray that you would restore relationships between parents and children. I pray that you would call those who are in sin this morning out of that sin so that they can again be renewed and restored by you and your spirit. Father, we love you so much. If that's your prayer this morning, would you say amen? Amen. amen. Now, I've only got two points for you. A little bit easier than pastor. He'd be coming with 10 to 12. I only got two for you this morning. I know. Some of you are like, oh, nice. You know, number one, it is never too late for God to forgive you. It is never too late for God to forgive. As long as you have breath in your lungs, as long as you are on this earth, it is never too late for God to forgive you. Now, for anyone in here, and I know that you are here. I don't know who you are, but you do. For anyone in here who believes that they are too far gone or too stuck into a sin, I want you to understand this is a beautiful prayer, is it not? There's sometimes in my life where I believe I get myself into places that God can't get me out of. There's no pit God can't get you out of. There's no trial that God cannot carry you through. And I don't know what that is for you this morning, but I know what David's is. Now, I want you to understand something that I often miss when I'm studying Psalm 51. 
When you go through his prayer, when you look at what David is praying, there's something very important here that we cannot miss. Not one word that David has prayed has been about anything to do with his situation. I want you to understand this very clearly, church. He has not prayed one word about his circumstances. In fact, not one word that he has poured out to God has been about anything external. Everything with David's prayer has to do with what is internal. Every single word of his prayer is about right here. And then he prays and he says, God, when you truly do restore me, I'll go tell others how to live for you too. Everything's about the internal. Now, for me as a believer, when I get myself in sin or when I get myself into pride or when I get myself into trial, I can tell you exactly what my prayers sound like. My prayers are all about the external. (laughs) My prayers are always about, God, come help me externally. God, I need you to get me out of this mess. God, I need you to save me from this trial. And what I miss is I miss that God is not trying to just do a work externally. He's trying to do a work internally. He's trying to do a work right here. See, what I love is, I wrote this down in my notes, for you and me, we cannot just be broken over the consequences of sin. We have to be broken over the sin itself. And I know that's tough, but it needs to be addressed. If we're only concerned about the consequences of sin and not over the sin itself, what that means is that means we're concerned with what sin means for us, but we're not concerned with what sin means to a holy God. See, it is an offense And that's why we continue to run back to the same sin, because we believe that we can get out of those consequences. I'm telling you, there is restoration, but we have to talk about that sin first. What is it for you? Because David in verse 4, he says, look with me at verse 4, he says, against you, God, against you alone I have sinned, God. David says, this is personal. David said, this isn't about what's happening to me. This ain't about the trial or or the consequences or that I got caught. It's not about that. It's that I have offended a holy God. And that's what has broken David's heart. Can I ask you something? Is the only reason you and me say no to sin because of the consequences? Or are we willing to say no because it's an offense to a holy God who loves us and died on the cross for us? That, right there, that's how you overcome sin. You don't just fall out of love with sin. You fall madly in love with Jesus Christ. That's how you do it. And David realized it. He says, I need to be in love with the Lord. I cannot be in love with this world. And so if I could give you something, if you're taking notes, it won't be on the screen, but I want you to write this down. When you do struggle, when you leave here, here's a practical action step with your prayers that God taught me the hard way. When you're struggling, whether it's a trial or a fear or a worry or a sin, don't just ask God to change the consequences of your sin. Ask God to change you when you sin. Do you know the power when you start praying that way? I've learned it myself because I'm a bonehead and I make mistakes all the time. When I pray for God to change me, I stop getting myself into those situations. Because the truth is, church family, God can save us from a thousand situations. But until he changes our heart, we're going to be right back in those situations again. (laughs) I'm the same way. I'm the same way. Until I love being healthy, I'm not going to stop eating those sugar cookies. (laughs) And if a college student is, no, they know. Like, the sugar cookies, that's my weakness. And my wife telling me, too, like, damn, you need to stop. But I can't just hate sugar cookies. That's a part of it. But what I got to do is I got to fall in love with being healthy. We tried to think if I can just hate that sin enough, I'll be good. No, no, no. Hate that sin. But the only way you can hate that sin is by falling in love with the Lord. And falling in love with his word and letting it radically change you. See, I wrote this down. God is not just a lifeguard. He's a heart surgeon. (laughs) See, a lifeguard pulls you up when you're drowning. And that's great. But a heart surgeon changes you from the inside out so that you'll stop going back to that sin that makes you drown. What good is it if he just pulls you up every single time? And that's what some of us want. Some of us get into these sins, we get into these trials, we get into these battles, these fears, and we just want God to keep pulling us up, but we don't want him to change us because that's what's causing us to fall. But he wants to change you. He wants to do a great work in you. Ephesians 4, verse 22 and 24, I love it. Paul says, to take off your formal way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, The one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. Now, for an entire year, I came to this service. I sat right back there in that section. In 2015, I wasn't saved. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know about anybody in here. I wasn't involved in a life group. Didn't know about anything to do with love God, love people, share Jesus, make disciples. The only thing I knew is God was drawing me, but I didn't really want him to. So I came to this service because I couldn't wake up for the 9 o'clock one. And I sat... Right? I couldn't make it on time. I'm telling you, earliest I was waking up was 1030. I was making it in the door by Jeff Maxwell finishing up his last song. And some of y'all are like, 
I get it. <laughs> and I would sit right back there all of 2015, convicted over my sin, but didn't know Jesus. And I can tell you exactly what I would say to me five years ago. What I would say is, Daniel, I can't do it. It's great for you to say that from the stage, but when I go home and I'm alone, it's a whole lot realer and it's a whole lot tougher. I say, Daniel, I, I can't get out of this sin because I'm too stuck in it. It's a part of me, and I don't even know if God wants to show me mercy over it at this point. And if that's you, I don't know if it is, but if it's you or even close to you, Jeremiah, I mean Isaiah 30 verse 18 says this right here. Therefore, the Lord is waiting to show you mercy. Isn't that powerful? Therefore, the Lord is waiting to show you mercy and is rising up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a just God, and all who wait patiently for him are happy. See, we leave forgiveness on the table simply because we don't ask for it. We leave mercy on the table simply because we don't ask for it, simply because we think it's too late, simply because we don't believe in the power of God to truly change us so that we'll stop running back to that same sin. We leave forgiveness on the table. I want to tell you, don't leave it on the table today. Take it. See, all those players had to do was wear that jersey. When you come to God and repent of your sins, all you have to do is wear the uniform of salvation, wear the grace of God, and then go out there and teach others how to do the same. Don't leave it on the table this morning. I love our pastor, Brother Steve, and my favorite quote, I think it's his best one. I don't know if he coined it or not, but I'll say he did. It's this right here. I love it. Before sin was in your heart, forgiveness was in God's heart. <laughs> Amen. When I was a kid, I made some dumb decisions. To be honest with you, as an adult, I make dumb decisions too. <laughs> like, I'm 27. I act like I'm so far from it. I make dumb decisions now. But when I was a kid... One summer, I made a fatal, fatal mistake. I'm not going to lie to you. I was in the eighth grade, so, you know, it was a terrible, terrible decision. I didn't tell my mom about it either. What I decided to do is I decided for an entire summer to drink soda every day, five times a day for the whole summer. <laughs> bro, bro, I didn't tell my mom either. I was, I was like an addict. Like, I was hooked on this stuff, man. And like my family, I love my family, bless them, but, man, we didn't have Dr. Pepper. We had Dr. Thunder. <laughs> Amen. Y'all know about that. Hey, we were a proud off-brand family. <laughs> we were a proud off-brand family. My wife does the same thing now, man. She don't buy Cheez-Its. She buys Savorites. <laughs> hey, you saving money, but they trash. <laughs> I'll tell you, man. I told her, I was like, Hannah, stop buying these. <laughs> stop buying these. <laughs> Some of y'all know, man. Some of y'all know what's up with it too, man. So I drank all this soda. I drank all this soda, man. And I woke up in the middle of the night and I had a terrible pain. I'm in the eighth grade. And like my pain's right here. And I'm like, man, this is bad. And so I go to my mom. My mom takes me to the hospital. I have a kidney stone. <laughs> Bro, if you've ever felt that pain, that pain's bad. I thought I was dying. I'd never broken a bone. I thought that this was it for me. And we get up to the counter and they're like, okay, yeah, it's going to be about an hour wait. <laughs> I was like, man, they do this with everybody that's dying? <laughs> I was like, no wonder the death rate's so high. I was like, man, they got people dying in the waiting room for an hour. Wait, I thought I was dying. I didn't know any better. You know what I mean? I didn't know any better. <laughs> and, uh, man, we, we sitting in the waiting room, and my pain's bad, but I'm like, I'm in the eighth grade, and there's other eighth grade girls around, so I'm like, I'm not going to show the pain. You know, I'm going to just have to tough it out, man. I'm going to just have to make it through. And my mom, this is no joke, it's a true story. She's here this morning. You can ask her. She says, Daniel, <clears throat> if you want to see the doctor, you're going to have to cry. <laughs> and I was like, huh? She's like, and cry loud. <laughs> they need to hear it back there. <laughs> you want a heart surgeon to hear it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I counted the cost <laughs> and let out the loudest cry I ever could in my life. I'm telling you, I let it out so loud. It was echoing through the hospitals. What's crazy is the doctors came running out. <laughs> and they took me right back. I look back at the other people, I was like, man, y'all better start crying. <laughs> They're like rolling me back there. <laughs> I learned that day, you can solve any problem by crying. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and uh, I really did, man, the craziest situations in life teach you the greatest truths, do they not? And I tell you, I've never forgotten that to this day, and here's why. I had such a pain inside of my body. Man, that pain was killing me. And it was that pain inside of me. That led me, even though I was scared of what others th thought about me, that pain led me to cry out for help, and I received help. And I want to tell you this morning, man, when it comes to that sin or that fear or that struggle, if you truly allow God 
to give you a pain and a conviction inside of you, it's that pain, it's that conviction that will lead you to cry out for help. That pain. See, I was in that waiting room. I cared what other people thought, so I just keep sitting through the pain. And some of you have been coming to the service for a few weeks, struggling with sin, wanting to come down here and talk to a pastor and receive prayer, but you haven't walked these aisles because you're scared of what other people think of you. I love you so much, but can I tell you, that's the same boat eighth grade me was in. That's the same boat me today is in. Who cares what other people think about you? If you have a pain inside of you and a conviction inside of you, cry out for help. Number one, to God in prayer. But number two, James 5, 16, confess your sin to somebody and be prayed over so that you may be healed. If that conviction's there, when that pain and that hurt over your sin gets strong enough, I believe you and I will cry out. If we're not crying out for help, I believe it's because we don't have enough pain over that sin. The Spirit of God wants to get you out of that. Today, not tomorrow, today. So, man, if God's put on your heart to come pray with somebody, come pray with somebody. You don't care what anybody else thinks about you. This church, we're supposed to love people anyway, top to bottom, no matter what. Look with me at verse 12 as we keep moving here. Verse 12, a famous passage of Scripture. A lot of us have probably memorized it. Restore the joy of your salvation to me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. Number two, it's never too late for God to restore you. It's never too late for God to restore you. Number one, it's never too late for God to forgive you. But with forgiveness, with repentance, always comes restoration. Always. Now I want to tell you something from John chapter 7. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible, but it's often overlooked. And for me it's overlooked because I didn't understand it for a long time. But I want you to understand this chapter of John is like a movie out of the Bible. Like, I love it. You may be familiar with it. You may not. But I believe that this could change your perspective on Jesus Christ. Now, I want to show you the first two verses of it. Look with me on the screen, if you will. John chapter 7. After this, Jesus traveled to Galilee since he did not travel to Judea because the Jews were trying to kill him. Now, the Jewish festival of shelters was near. Another translation says the Feast of Booths. And every single time I would read about this festival, I would say, what in the world is this festival? What in the world is the significance of what Jesus has entered himself into here? Uh, It's also called the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, remember for a moment, this feast that they're doing in Jesus' day commemorated the 40-year period that Israel was in the wilderness. They disobeyed God. They continued to choose sin. And because of that, God had to take them the long way. (laughs) And for a lot of us, When we choose to disobey God, God has to take us the long way. I've been there. (laughs) He's so good. Any the short way or the long way, he's good. And it commemorates that, but it's also a harvest festival, celebrated agricultural and seasonal celebration. Now, during this festival, here's what happened, and we forget this in our context and our culture in America today. What was fascinating about in Jesus' day is they would come together at this festival, and they would pray for rain. They were terrified that they would not have rainfall and that their crops would die. Remember, they lived on the edge of the desert. There wasn't a whole lot of water. For us in America, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around that because man, we waste water when we're brushing our teeth. <laughs> I mean, we got water bottles on deck. It's hard for us to realize how desperately they were dependent on God. They were dependent on God for rain. They had to have it. And what's crazy is at the point of this festival, hear this, nearly six months will have gone by with no rainfall. Six months No rainfall, and then they come together to pray for rain. Now, that's crazy. It's hard for us to imagine, and they're worried over the crops. Now, for hundreds and hundreds of years, people participated in this feast, but they missed the purpose of it. See, for hundreds and hundreds of years, they participated in this festival, but they missed the meaning behind it. And what I love is Jesus is going to show up in John chapter 7 and redirect their understanding of why they're there in the first place because they've forgotten. And I love this. So every day, the feast lasted seven days in the Old Testament. Eight days in Jesus' day. And what would happen is every day a priest would leave the temple. He would come out, and this is what he would do. I wrote it down because I didn't want to mess this up. He would come out with all the people worshiping around him, and he would lead people to the pool singing the words of Isaiah 12, verse 3. You can imagine a huge amount of people all following the priest singing these words right here. Here it is, Isaiah 12, verse 3. Therefore, with joy, you will draw from the water of wells of salvation. Therefore, with joy, you will draw from the wells of salvation. And the priest would fill a golden pitcher 
You can imagine a beautiful golden pitcher. You fill it up with water. Silver trumpets would blow. Palm tree branches. Huge scene. Excitement, celebration. Music sound, and I'm telling you, it's huge. And this is where they would shout Hosanna. Do you know what Hosanna means? It means save us. We've heard Hosanna in the highest, right? It's not bad. I don't lead worship, but that's not bad. <laughs> Hosanna means save us. This is, where, this is where they would sing Hosanna. And so what's amazing here is the priest would hold up the golden pitcher. When he would hold up that golden pitcher, that symbolized God's provision for Israel to provide water. That when they were in the desert, God had already gone before them to think about their need for water before they realized they were thirsty. Isn't it amazing that God goes before you to think about your needs before you even realize you needed them? And that's the beauty of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins before you and I even realized we needed him to. Isn't that amazing? Now here's where it gets crazy. This is why I love this chapter. Because when you think about it, man, it's crazy what happens. So in the silence, right, the priest holds up the golden pitcher, shouting stops, tree branches stop, the trumpets are silent, all is silent. Everybody's looking at the priest. And it's in this moment that a Middle Eastern Jewish rabbi named Jesus Christ breaks the silence. More quiet than this. And Jesus stands up. As they've been six months without rain, thirsty, praying to God for rain to fall, Jesus says this. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He says, on the last and most important day, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. He shouts that. And then it goes back to silence. Can you imagine the scene? Can you imagine how shook you would have been? I would have been shook. Like, man, he got some Dasani bottles I don't know about. Like, like, that's crazy. But he breaks the silence. And he tells them, if you're thirsty, I'm all you need. I know it's been six months without rain. I know it's been dry. I know you've been struggling. But if anybody is thirsty, all you need is me. Let me make a statement to you, church family. Jesus is not interrupting the festival. Jesus is interpreting the festival. He is revealing the true meaning of it that their hearts have missed for hundreds and hundreds of years. They've been coming to this festival, and all they have thought about is how dry their land is. They have come to this festival, and all they have thought about is their crops. All they have thought about is their physical needs. And Jesus says, you've been so focused on your physical needs and how dry this world is, you haven't even looked at your soul to see how dry you are without me. He says, come to me. Come to me if you're thirsty. That's what this feast is all about. Church family, can I ask you a question this morning? Are you going through the motions? Are you at the right festival, but with the wrong purpose? Are you in the right place with the wrong posture? Because, see, for hundreds and hundreds of years, they came for the external and forgot about the internal. Why are you here this morning at church, at Bellevue Baptist Church, 2000 Appling Road at 11 o'clock? I want to tell you, it's not just to dress nice. It's not just to put your hands up. That's great. You keep on putting your hands up in worship. It's not even just to say hey to the people next to you. Praise God that we get to do that. But the reason God brought you here this morning is to get your eyes to focus on how desperately your soul needs Jesus, whether you're 20 or 80 or 180 years old. You need Jesus. That's why David, when he prays in Psalm 51, he prays this right here. He says, wash me and cleanse me. It's because he knows in his soul he's going to the one who has the living water to cleanse him. You know, every single one of us in here so desperately want to know our purpose, want to know so desperately why we're here. There is nobody in your life. I love all your friends. I love all your coworkers and your family. But there's nobody in your life who can tell you, hey, if your soul is thirsty, come to me. I got you. Not a single person. Ain't nobody at that festival can stand up and say what Jesus did. And ain't nobody stand up and say that in here. But some of us live so much for the approval of other people and the approval of other couples and what people see or think about us that you think we were chasing after them for living water. But they can't give it to you and they can't give it to me. The only one who can give you water, living water that will restore your soul is Jesus Christ. One of the things I wrote down is many of us go through the motions with Christianity with our hands, but we miss what God is doing with our hearts. David says, you don't delight in burnt offering. You don't delight in sacrifices if the heart is not there. 
What God wants is your heart. Desperation for Christ will always bring restoration from Christ. So this morning, maybe it's your marriage. I've only been married for two minutes. (laughs) I haven't figured much out. I can tell you what I'm figuring out, though. That if Hannah is above God, that's a problem. A big problem. As good as she is, I tell people, hey, she's great. She's incredible. She's phenomenal. I don't know why she married me. (laughs) But if she's above God, that's a problem. And some of us in here, man, we love our spouses so much, but they're getting to that point where they're a little bit above God. They can't provide your soul what Jesus, living water, can provide for your soul. Some of us in here, our marriages might be falling apart. Let's call it what it is. You know that nobody can restore your marriage the way God Almighty can. And some of you think it's too late. Some of you, real deal, have bought the lie from Satan that it's too late for God to restore your marriage. That's a lie from the pits of hell. Your marriage is never too far gone. God can restore it. Or maybe it's your kids. I work with college students all the time, and all of them, so many of them, are tempted every day with the world. Tempted with sin, tempted with idolizing themselves. And maybe your kids are not close to God. Maybe they don't even know God. And you feel like you want to quit praying for them. Let me tell you something. Please don't, because there is nobody who can bring your child back to him the way God can. Don't quit. Amen. Don't quit. My mom said something to me I'll never forget. For 21 years of my life, to be honest with you, I did not believe God wanted somebody like me. I just never thought that God would want somebody like me. What I believed in my heart was God didn't want me, and I didn't want him either. So if we just keep our distance, we'll be okay. And this is not exaggerating. The last place I ever wanted to be was church or around Christians. I hated it. This was five years ago, six years ago. I hated Christianity. I hated church. I came to this service for a full year to learn from Brother Steve and soak up leadership qualities and leave the Jesus behind. And the Holy Spirit had different plans. (laughs) Because you can't be a good leader without the Spirit of God living inside of you anyway. (laughs) And, man, I remember through college and through high school, I lived a very dark and sinful lifestyle. A very dark and sinful lifestyle. I put my identity in other people's approval. I found my value and success, and ultimately, to be honest with you, I spent every single day not knowing who my creator was. 21 years old, college student, University of Memphis. Came to the service for a year. You would have saw me. Didn't speak to anybody. I snuck in and snuck out. I was lost. And I've never forgotten what it was like to be lost. Have you? Whether you were saved at 8 or whether you were saved at 21, have you forgotten what it was like to be lost? Because in this prayer, David remembers. That's why he says, restore the joy of my salvation, because I've forgotten it. My wife was saved when she was young, and she asked me sometimes, she says, Daniel, what was it like to be lost at 21 years old? My answer to her is always the same. I said, baby, it was hopelessness. I said, as a 21-year-old about to go into the work world, graduating college, I can't tell you how scary it was not knowing why I was on this earth or where I was going after it. Scary, hopeless, trying to save myself, trying to wash and clean my own laundry, and God showed me you can't do it. It's too dirty. You're trying to clean it, but you're part of the problem. (laughs) You need somebody sinless to clean it for you. And in 2015, around Christmas, I I hit rock bottom. I'd been coming to the services for years and for a year now, and Brother Steve was preaching sermons, and it was convicting my heart, and I was fed up with my sin, I was fed up with loneliness, I was fed up with being broken, and I sat down, and my mom could see that I was broken, and I remember my mom looking at me clear as day, and she said these words, she says, Daniel, you need God, and God wants you, and I'll tell you my response back to her, at 21 years old, five years ago, I said, Mom, it's too late for me, I was like, I'm 21, I'm about to go into work world. I'm about to go out there and coach. That whole God stuff, that church stuff, they don't want me. Believe me, Mom. I was like, they do not want me there. And I said, it's too late for me. And the whole vibe shifted in our conversation. She'll remember this. The whole vibe shifted. And she looked at me, and she got real serious. And I got real scared because I thought she was about to whoop me. You're never too old for a whooping. And uh, (laughs) she looks at me, and she says, Daniel, it is never too late for God to save you. A few nights later, I found myself at a park at midnight, the day after Christmas. I laid down on the ground, face down in tears, because I didn't know Jesus, and I didn't know what to do. 
And I didn't know how to read the Bible. The only way I knew how to read the Bible was to Google verses when you're in need. <laughs> That's the only way I knew how. And I Googled verses when you're in need. And one popped up under the category of when you need help. And let me tell you something. I needed more help than I could have ever realized that day. And it took me to a verse, Jeremiah 15, verse 19. And when I read it, I was shook. Jeremiah 15, verse 19 says, The Lord says, if you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. And all I could think about was my mom telling me it's never too late for you. And that verse, that truth, that it's never too late is the reason why I gave my life to Jesus Christ at that park, face down, in tears. That right there. So can I ask you a question? Why not you? Why not you and why not now? It is not too late for you. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, it is not too late for you. You are not too far gone. You are not too lost. Jesus says in John 7, come to me and I will restore your soul. If you're a believer and you're stuck in that sin and you're tired of running back to that same sin, dealing with the same fears, the same strongholds, the same pain, the same depression, the same worry, I want to tell you, no matter how long you've been a Christian, Jesus' message is the same. Come to me and I will restore you. So why not you? And why not now?